here in about uh, 12 minutes. I just wanted to uh, welcome you uh, early networkers uh, coming in to, uh, to see this fantastic panel that we put together. Um, what are the amazing parts about an immersive world is that uh, I always look at trying to meet a new friend uh, because in today's uh, age that uh, we're all doing so much remote activities, remote engagements, the hard thing is is is, is actually connecting and meeting new people in in the uh, the online world. And uh, these virtual events, um, I hope that each and every one of you are going to meet somebody new today, uh, either before the event or after the event, so you can have the start of a of a new friendship or a new relationship. So that being said, um, let's get things started with in the public chat bottom left. Let's just uh, let us know where you're uh, logging in from, and uh, and uh, what's your uh, you know your favorite uh, favorite food? How about that? And we can kind of get to know some folks who are, have joined us. Blair's coming in from San Diego. Pamela from Dallas. Welcome, Pamela. We got Heather from Seattle. Hey, Heather, thanks for joining. Blair's favorite food is burrito. Any particular type of burrito, Blair? Um, Bob from Toronto. Ryan in from Dallas. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Bob. Adam from Vancouver. And Maya's from Vegas. And you always great great sushi in Vegas. Um, now that they brought in all these celebrity chefs, I, I don't think 25 years ago, I would have ordered the sushi, sushi in Vegas. Uh, hey, Rod, good to see you. Welcome back. Carne asada burrito. Yes, Blair, I'm a big fan of that. San Diego's got the best carne asada. Hey, Daisy, thanks for joining us from San Antonio. Daisy's a new member of the Rubella team. Uh, Joseph from Florida. Welcome. Well, what we're going to do is as we're filtering more folks in, uh, we're going to turn on a feature here in Verbella, what we call private volumes, creates a space uh, around every five chairs or so, so that you can have a conversation that's private uh, in, in the auditorium. Uh, we also have a feature in the auditorium where we can turn on what we call spatialized audio, which would actually, if we turn that on, if you're in the back of the auditorium, you can have a conversation and we wouldn't hear you in the front. But this private volume feature really allows you to have kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations very easily without being kind of interrupted or distracted. So I'm going to turn those on. Then want you to uh, you know, say hi to somebody next to you that you might not know or jump into a private volume where you've not met somebody there and, and just say hello, introduce yourself, maybe find out what organization you're with or what brought you into the round table here. And, uh, and so for the next 10 minutes, um, you know, you can meet somebody new and uh, you can bounce into multiple private volumes to introduce yourself. And again, maybe you'll meet uh, two or three new friends here before we get things started. So gonna turn the private volumes back on uh have a have a goal of at least meeting one or two new friends here in this in this space and uh and then we'll uh, get the event started here in about uh nine minutes have fun private volumes going on in three two one
All right. Gave you all enough warning to uh, turn up private volume, so I think that's you in mid mid conversation. Uh, hopefully, you uh, you met somebody new uh, in the last ten minutes as you've uh, come into Verbella Open Campus here for our fantastic L and D roundtable. Welcome to everybody uh, who's joined us here, uh, and uh, excited to have this conversation get started. Um, Thanks first off um, to uh, the Verbella team for scheduling and organizing this event. Uh, our, our team of, of Marco and Maya and Molly on the marketing side, Blair here, who works uh, both for with our team and EXP, our parent company, Ekaterina from our event services group. Thank you to everybody for, for joining us and, and, and supporting it. Thanks to all of you that uh, have joined us as, as an audience and taken the leap into immersive experiences. It's great to see some, uh, some old faces and some new faces and uh, thank you for, for jumping in here. Uh, we'll jump into some introductions here. Uh, just very honored uh, and excited to have th this group of panelists. Um, really uh, a, a terrific group to, to to learn from today. Let me start with some brief introductions and then we'll we'll jump into some of the the exciting topics today. Uh, first off, going to introduce Terry Jacobs. Uh, Terry is a senior manager of L and D design and development for BDO, uh, which is an international accounting firm with more than 60 locations and 400 alliance firms in the US alone. Terry and her team have used Rebel in a variety of ways from large interactive meetings for a nationwide audience to a blended learning tool where Rebel is used for breakout uh, round robin pods to encourage collaboration as well as hands on learning. Both cases have been highly effective to help BDO associates meet their continuing education requirements and have received very positive feedback. Welcome, Terry. Good to have you. Also, I Thanks, Terry. Also introducing Jan Koster, Innovation Principal at SAP. Uh, Jan focuses on how we can innovate the way we engage with our customers. Uh, he's based in the Netherlands and focuses on the EMEA North region for SAP. Uh, in late 2019, early 2020, uh, they created an enablement program for their colleagues, which focused on how to deliver an experience to their customers rather than giving a presentation and a five day classroom training, but that was before COVID. So we'll learn about Jan's uh, pivot in, uh, in 2020 uh, 20 and 2021. Uh, we'll, we'll hear about today. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Good to have you here, Jan. And then Frank, Frank is uh, calling in from uh, Milan today. Uh, Frank is CEO and founder of Virtuoso, which is the world's first turnkey virtual reality learning solution for enterprises. Currently over 1 million business users. Frank designed and ran 700 plus innovation and learning development programs for corporate clients in Europe, US and Asia. Frank is also an inventor of many patents as has won numerous awards, including the UK Queen's Award for Enterprise Learning and Performance Institute Awards and the Best in British Tech Award in 2020. But with that introduction, Frank, I think I learned some new things about you as well. Um, what's, uh, thanks for, for joining us, Frank. It's great to have you as well on the panel. Thank you, everyone. And I learned something about me as well. So thank you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to teach you about yourself yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think what's what's really impressive and, and and is that you know everybody is hearing about the metaverse, of course, because of our friends at Facebook now Meta. It's it's become pushed into the uh the, the common uh i guess the common dialogue the kind of the joke around verbella is that now our collective parents are aware of what we do and what and they have a better understanding of what the metaverse is uh and so i think that's really helping uh kind of uh raise all tides so to speak in the harbor for everybody in in the virtual reality space so 
Frank, from, from your perspective, I'll start off with a, kind of a metaverse question because you, you have a million business users, which is incredible. And so the, enter, the metaverse for the enterprise is kind of talked about like it's coming, but obviously for Virtuoso, it, it's already been here. And so I wanted to get to your perspective of how the pandemic, uh, as well as Facebook's you know, pivot, uh, you know, how did, how did it affect Virtuoso and, you know, the, the hundreds of, of enterprise clients that are, that are using your platform? Thank you, Craig. Well, first of all, uh, I would you like to underline the fact that we didn't prepare equations up front, right? So it's all kind of freestyle and uh, thank you for giving me straight away the spot about the metaverse. <laughs> I, I changed um, the script a little bit already, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine, that's fine. Well, you know, guys, um, I've been involved in, in virtual reality since 1995. So I can tell you that I've seen everything almost, you know, around, around VR uh, for business primarily, because that's where we're coming from. So it's important, first of all, to split uh, the, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, applications, because when we talk about consumer, we got all sorts of applications which are completely different from business. Now, I can talk about business because uh, that has been my background for the past of uh, you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, and if I can answer that from, from a B2B point of view, I can tell you that the, the metaverse concept, as well as the virtual reality, uh, technology has been um, around for quite a while now. Okay, so let me tell you a story. I mean, I don't know again the the age of the audience, but I do remember very well uh, the time of Second Life. In fact, uh, um, I was uh, at the time the first certified partner in Europe about Second Life, and um, Second Life proposition was all about what we are trying to experience in nowadays. The problem at the time, I mean, there were several problems, including technology, of course. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that technology has been there, you know, uh, in different kind of, with different features, different kind of modality of uh, utility, modalities of, of installation apps and stuff like that. But what happened with the pandemic is that again i'm talking from 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 our experience into the business companies realize that remote immersive or remote engaging technology broadly speaking it's not anymore a nice to have so digital technology has been there you know and even uh, companies were using uh, learning and development technologies digitally and remotely, like, uh, you know, e-learning with through a learning management system and stuff like that. But when you engage, when you talk to them about how you can make that remote learning much more engaged, they really didn't pay a lot of attention rather than, oh, yeah, let's try, you know, let me see. Uh, maybe it was kind of a phishing, scouting type of experience. That was a pre-COVID. With the COVID instead, they realized that when you got the majority of employees working from home, working remotely, you realize that maybe the tools that you are using today are not effective as you think they are. Or you may knew it, but you didn't do too much about it because you still have got the majority of the users, majority of your employees in presence. Okay. So what's happening is that more and more L&D and the transformation people started looking more seriously about these kind of engaging technologies. And uh, the, one of the key engaging technology is it's virtual reality. OK, so what's happening is that we were already growing dramatically exponentially pre-COVID. Uh, but during the COVID, we simply got a massive boost. As I said, not because the technology changed it, but because right. the needs come a must. 
So, exactly. Uh, exactly. It, was, it was an amazing experience, but at the same time, Craig, it was not easy to manage the deployment because everyone was at home, if you wish, you know, and everyone had a personal life. So by the fact that people, companies want to deploy this technology, they had to deal with the personal life as well, because you like it or not, each of us had some kind of, unfortunately, bad story in our family uh, through this COVID. So it was a really weird uh, <laughs> period where the business was growing, but at the same time, you had to manage also the personal lives of, of your colleagues, of your employees, and also of your clients. A lot, a lot to, to consider uh, in, in kind of both a massive change in, you know, the world affecting, uh, you know, uh, the entire globe, affecting organizations, change affecting individuals, as you say, to from from mental health challenges because of the stresses of of what was happening. Uh, with, with with Terry and Jan's perspective, as they were running their own L and D efforts, I'll, I'll start with um, Jan. What what were the sort of big uh, biggest challenges, given the context that there's probably multiple big challenges in the last year and a half? Tell us about the biggest challenges you saw, Jan, in your organization, and love to hear how you you addressed it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you already mentioned it during the um, uh, during the introduction. We were setting up a, a program, a program for um, 500 of my colleagues. Um, they're all customer facing uh, people, um, and what they normally do, they uh, let's nail it down. They they give presentations, they give some demonstrations to the customer. But we made a, we set up a program, and that learned them how to really deliver an experience how you deliver an experience rather than just giving a presentation. And uh, we set up a program um, and it was much, it was a, 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 let's say a five day classroom training. So what do you do then? You fly people in somewhere to a location, maybe to our headquarters in, in Germany or to, uh, to somewhere a nice hotel. And then we're gonna, we're gonna give them a training for five days. But it was late uh, 2019, 2020. And then all of a sudden in March, in in Europe, there was this uh, there was this lockdown. So we were there with that plan, and he said, "Well, we might just as well throw it away because there's no way that we are allowed to travel for at least uh, the rest of uh, 2020. Well, almost at the end of 2021, and <laughs> we're still not there. And um, travel uh, still a lot of travel restrictions. Um, so uh, we actually put that plan in uh, in the fridge." And we had to deal with um, with with some other uh, complexities because th the question was how are we going to engage with our customers now because we're not allowed to travel etc. We cannot go to the office. The the the, the customer is at home. Um, uh, but after a month, we we took it out of the the fridge again, so so said, and um, we've said okay, we really have to redesign this program. I mean, the the the, the purpose should be the same. Um, we still want to learn them and enable them how to deliver an experience, uh, but we have to do it in a different way. Um, so we were researching some some technology, um, uh, obviously as well meeting meeting people in a virtual way like Fabela, but we also came to a uh, to a different uh, learning method, um, um, and that's called micro learning. And uh, we teamed up with uh, uh, with a company based in Singapore. It's called Nobi. And they, uh, it's a micro learning platform. What does it mean? They have a mobile device. Um, they have a mobile app for your um, uh, for your mobile device. And what we did, we actually put all the content that we wanted to deliver in a classroom training. We turn it into a micro learning. Um, what does a micro learning mean? It is uh, a very the, the, all the content is 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 um, put, put in in like the digestible chunks. And, um, and the content uh, will be released on a daily basis. So that means on day one, you have a piece of content. It only takes you 15, one, five, 15 minutes to consume. Uh, you just have to wait for the next day. You get a second uh, piece of, uh, uh, of content. Um, and that's how we actually guide them through a couple of weeks. We, we guide them through all the content. 
Um, but of course, you know, um, the, the way that you can now spread it over a couple of weeks rather than to squeeze everything in five days, we actually, actually also had some, some advantages over there. Uh, why? Uh, well, because, um, the, because the program was now stretched over a couple of weeks, it was in total 50 weeks, um, people already could start applying it in a customer context when they were on the phone or a Zoom call in a Teams meeting or prep preparing an, uh, an experience. Um, but we also had to make sure that um, 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 that the, all the learnings, they learn something, they apply it in a customer context, but they also can bring it back to their colleagues. Oh, I learned something in this training and I applied it to the customer, and this is what the result was, and he's sharing it with their peers. So we were now able to um, and to, to, to actually Actually, thanks to COVID, you could say we were able to set up a completely new program um, and we were there was a certain philosophy behind it and we call it that the new learning. It's not only about gaining new knowledge, uh, but it's not only about to know, but also it also allows you to give time to think about it, to reflect. Hey, I learned something. What does that mean for me? How am I going to apply it? Um, uh, it's also about yourself. Or how high do I set the bar? Where do I set the bar? And so you know, you think, you're going to reflect, you're going to apply it in customer context. And uh, uh, fourth, um, you also go to share it with your peers. So we set up actually a program there that, um, that was more than just sending knowledge to the, uh, to the employees, but that we also allow them to know, think, reflect on the content, apply, apply it in a customer context, uh, share, share with your, um, uh, with your peers. So we, we had to overcome a challenge. How are we going to deliver a training program in times of COVID where we're not allowed to travel? Um, and actually, uh, why I'm saying this, I actually realize we turn it to an advantage because now we really had to try out new things. And it's actually also what Frank said, it's not a nice to have anymore. It's also now a must to apply new technologies to uh, deliver a learning and development uh, 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 program. So there's a little bit in a nutshell what we, we did. Um, maybe also good to mention, so where did we use, for example, Verbela for, is that uh, at the end of the program, we everybody want to get them together. And uh, first of all, to celebrate, to, um, to celebrate the end of the journey, but also that there is a moment of uh, where people can share. They can share what was my learning journey? Uh, what was it? What did it look like? What was positive for me? What did I, what, uh, what did I learn? Uh, and also a nice moment to start sharing customer cases. Well, I learned something and applied it in this customer case. I applied it in that customer case. And we did it in, in a virtual way um, in, the, in, this, um, in this Verbela world. So that's in a nutshell um, uh, what we did with um, uh, yeah with the learning and development in uh, with within SAP. Love it. Uh, I, I think that's a fantastic story, uh, Jan. And I, I love the idea of micro learning. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you mentioned that and that Nobi platform. I, I was not familiar with Nobi, uh, and. But I, I want to check it out because I know from having run my own team trainings over the years that kind of longer sessions don't don't turn into better results. Uh, yep. And I think this concept of micro learning is is really interesting because you know especially with our attention spans becoming shorter, yep. <laughs> they're not getting any yep. longer. You know, with with social media, that it's it's such an important concept to think about. And 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 the idea of Right then, having sort of a a shared experience as part of that leading that learning or to share the learnings, I know from our our, our organizational psychology team that founded Verbella that these kind of pedagogies around sort of mm -hmm. shared learnings help for retention and for learning it. So a couple of different great concepts in there to to unpack some more. Uh, I'll come back to I think a couple of those things later on in our discussion, but I want to want to give Terry an opportunity to talk about challenges that she had at BDO and you know some of the concepts that you were really thinking about as you as you address those challenges, Terry. Thanks, Craig. Um, so similar to Jan Prior to COVID, we had the same situation. A lot of our training was in person, these national training conferences. And obviously when 
the world came to a screeching halt, we needed to pivot and figure out what was the best way to handle um, our training and have these national training programs still to give them the training they need. Our situation is a little bit different in the sense that a lot of our professionals need to get a certain number of continuing education credits. And in order to do that, there's certain criteria that we need to meet in order to be able to provide them with those credits. So um, some of our limitations, I know Jan talked about microlearning. We're unfortunately not able to give credit for microlearning at this point in time. So we had to kind of reassess a little bit kind of what we were how we're going to approach this. So um, we did make a, um, an effort to create what we call our media production team. So we brought on, um, we did a few of our associates as well as um, expanded the team a bit to actually provide the firm with a media production team. So we were able to assist those who needed to take that training on a virtual level. Um, Obviously, there's some training that's more of a presentation that we can still provide the continuing education credits for with offering um, just more of points and polling and that type of thing. But then we've also um, combined or had the efforts of our instructional design team to help um, these different groups and these different business lines to really develop some interactive learning in the sense they still used a platform of some sort, but instead of just polling and um, checkpoints, they were doing, you know, breakout rooms and small group activities and discussions and whiteboards and that type of thing and using the technology that was available to us at the time. Um, as anything, you do run into what do you want to call the virtual fatigue or webinar fatigue or what have you. Um, it does eliminate, and I think you even mentioned it, um, Craig, in the beginning of you still have to encourage people to collaborate and talk and discuss even on a virtual level at, um, as much as you do in person. So trying to encourage people to do some of that interactivity and impromptu collaboration um, from that standpoint, you know, it's not always easy to coordinate that um, as much as we would like to. Um, I think Transitioning from a live facilitation to a virtual facilitation, you also run the risk of the facilitator's expertise. You know, some feel very comfortable up in front of a, a group and facilitating in front of a group, but the technology itself scares them or what have you. So there, we had to help with some of those challenges as well. And as you can, you know, probably guess where this is going after, you know, we all thought that <laughs> It was going to be a short time frame, but as we get into now almost two years um, into this whole thing that um, we also ran into people wanting something different, wanting something new, you know, take it to the next level. And as we started working with some of our internal clients doing that, that's what brought Verbella into the mix in the sense of we did some of that presentation interactive course for them to get the, or their continued education credits, but then that hands-on type of um, training, tool type training, we use Rebella to have them in a more of a small group interaction, hands-on type of, um, for them to learn and to um, use a variety of tools in order to get that, the best learning experience for them. Yeah, that, there's there's a lot there that you've uh, you've covered there, Terry. Thanks for for uh, giving us that perspective. A couple things that come to mind, um, and, and some of this maybe we come back to, but I wanted to ask, like, these are credits for counting um, accountants who they're required to get this these credits, and so there's almost like a captive audience, so to speak. Um, how did that? kind of play into whether that you thought about something sort of innovative and new like for Bella, was that, did it make it easier to kind of roll something like this out or harder? Um, Want to get your kind of, you know, that your perspective on that, because it's one thing to do this from, you know, if it's, if it's optional, it's another thing if people are, you know, work for a company where they're kind of forced to go into the training or, or from a, from a uh, industry 
certification perspective. I wanted to get your quick thoughts on that. That's a great question. Um, and, you know, it can be good or bad, right? So it's good in the sense that we, they need to take it. So they're going to take it. Um, it's bad in the sense that sometimes they're not as engaged as they could be because they're just fulfilling that requirement because they know they need the credit. Um, so when we did the combination of, um, and we're actually still in the midst of it all, but did the combination of actually doing that session where they would actually get the credit, get the knowledge they needed, but then give them that opportunity to practice and collaborate with their um, coworkers and so forth on using that particular tool um, or standard or whatever the case might be. That's when we used the uh, Verbella and they came in and that's the excitement part, right? That they can actually collaborate and work with um, each other. So it, it kind of can be a, a double-edged sword almost. Um, we get them in the door, or we get them in the you know seats or on the, the virtual seat um, because they need the credit, but we also need to keep things new and, and fresh in order to keep them coming or getting that additional performance support piece versus just the knowledge. Got it, got it. What 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 is? It? I'll give you one more question because I'm just fascinated by the 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 way that you know you, you've you've adjusted the approach um, when you're talking to your uh, you know the, your uh, I should say the uh, the students so to speak uh, your 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 attendees is are they looking to do more virtual or more are they looking forward to more in person? What is that sort of feedback look like? We get a lot of mixed sort of feedback on this ourselves when we talk to our clients. It's like people are urging to get back in a person. They also love the fact that they can engage effectively online with no travel or no cost associated with it that are, you know, logistics. I'm curious to what you're hearing from your uh, big cross section of of uh, of accounting firms across across the country and the globe. Um, I think I don't think as we know it as those big national conferences um, as we used to have them will be the case anymore. We're looking at it more as a continuous learning model versus you know these conferences you know once or twice a year for each of our business lines to get their you know concentrated amount of training. So we're looking at more of that continuous. And the in-person will probably be more regional or office-based um, to get that training to kind of combine that. But with that being said, to your point, you know, some are itching to get back, but also some have no desire to get back to the office, which they'd have to do to get that, you know, in-person side. So we are really taking a hard look at how we can do that hybrid. You know, we've got some who are in the classroom at the time and some who are still on a virtual, but they want to get the training at the same time. So we do have some of those additional challenges ahead of us as far as what's the best way and still obviously meet the standards and criteria that we need to in order to still provide the um, credits that they need. Interesting. Interesting. That's that's uh, that's a really uh, interesting perspective. Thanks, Terry. I, I think what we hear a lot about is sort of defining the ROI on these sorts of engagements. You know, how do we how do we know where success is, particularly because this is such a new world of online and immersive engagement. So I'm going to throw that question to you, Frank, since you run so many programs across so many different organizations. What are you seeing uh, the way that your customers are measuring kind of a return on investment when it comes to implementing something so new, like a, you know, virtuoso, uh, you know, VR learning platform. What is kind of the commonality of, of, of sort of response metrics that you're seeing from your clients that they, they focus on to, to ensure that they're getting sort of value out of their, their engagements? <clears throat> Sure. Um, so first of all, before I answer that question, it's important to understand um, when you talk to L&D teams in a business, you need to understand uh, their business itself, right? So uh, let, let me rephrase this. The majority of the business 
perceive LED as a cost in an organization. Okay, and this is a big problem. The, you know, so this is a big problem because LND teams are constantly uh, challenging to provide the uh, uh, ROI for, for their programs, yeah, and for their, let's say, existence, if you know what I mean. I know it sounds a little bit dramatic, but if you deep dive into uh, LND teams in, 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 in business, uh, they, they constantly need to prove their, their value. And therefore, it's important that every money that they spend, they spend in the right way to achieve their, their objectives, you know, which are then at the end of the day, the company objective. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because with these technologies, with VR immersive technologies, it's so easy to get a wow effect. Okay. And everybody will say, yeah, let's have a go, right? Let, let me see it. But problem with these technologies, if, if you don't apply correctly in a pedagogy point of view, after the first time that they experience it, the second time the wow disappeared, right? So it's important that everything that you do uh, for your customers, you do in a way that you, you, you always keep in mind what are the KPIs. The KPIs uh, uh, change, you know, there are so many KPIs depending on the business itself, but the most common ones are the one, uh, let's split the KPIs in two different categories. You got the hard KPIs and the soft KPIs. So KPIs that you can measure, a KPI that you cannot measure, right? So for example, when we think about um, user satisfaction, right? No doubt, we all know that immersive technologies provide a, a 30% increase in user satisfaction. But then it's hard to put some numbers against that Okay, you can use some creativity, but essentially it's harder to provide some numbers there. But then you got other KPIs uh, like user performance, which you know can be improved by seventy percent. And by the way, all these numbers that I'm giving you, they are part of PwC, Accenture, Oculus, and and our own research. So I'm happy to share with you the links afterwards. I remember the report. I remember the report. We've we've referenced it many times ourselves. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so basically, the way that we work with our clients, Craig, is that we analyze their current KPIs, and then we try to understand if we can enhance uh, the existing KPIs, as well as introducing other new KPIs that maybe they didn't think about because they didn't have an immersive technology before. Okay, and and what you have to do, you really need to keep an eye on on the data. Because at the end of the proof of concept, at the end of the program, the pilot, whatever thing you want to call it, then the reality comes together. So basically, you need to collect all this data, and then you need to put together some sort of a business case, right? A business case that prove that what you have done has actually got a tremendous values for the company. And therefore, it's important to deploy at a larger scale. Right. Um, so that's that's what we usually do. That is the kind of the path, the, the kind of standard path. You start mm -hmm. with a pilot proof of concept, uh, um, show how the soft benefit, soft uh, KPIs, and then after that you analyze it, build a business case to deploy at scale within an organization. Okay. So that's how usually it, it works. But essentially, um, there are so many KPIs which are around. You know, uh, uh, things like uh, improve, we all say improve uh, the retention of the content. But this is again, retention of the content, it's not a new concept. It's a concept based in a cone of learning. So L&D people knows very well the cone of learning, which says simply that if you read something, <clears throat> after two weeks, you will remember 10% of what you read, yeah. okay? Yeah. Instead, if you watch something, like a video, like an animation, or whatever, you will remember 40-50%. Instead, if you do or you simulate that type of experience, right, it can be, again, soft skills or it can be a hard uh, skill, they will remember up to 90%. This is, you know, consolidated and, and no, no doubts about this, uh, this 
simple but really strong uh, benefit that you gain with immersive technologies. Yeah, there, there, there is uh, one thing for sure is this uh, kind of is the beginning of like breaking open these these pedagogies of learning. Uh, I'm not an academic, uh, but the ones that are uh, from our educational team, our our, our co-founders are academics and PhDs in, in organization psychology, uh, folks from design background and from particularly from UC San Diego. And a lot of this is is really the passion of why Verbella was launched was that learning with others present in a in a social way, whether that's in person uh, or immersive create a different way of retaining and engaging that content and, and of course what virtuoso is doing is engaging beyond social engagement but really into the activity of, of viewing while learning which is which is what i've learned from uh years of, of of managing teams is that workshops where you're actually participating versus you know consuming the content, reading it or watching it, but participating in the action of, of learning is, is a, a key uh, aspect of the uh, pedagogy principles there. Fa fascinating Absolutely. stuff. I mean, I think the data that you're probably collecting right now around engagement, probably a gold mine for your clients to, to kind of mine and really determine kind of how well, you know, a common sort of set of knowledge is being Deployed across these uh, these enterprises and these organizations. Absolutely, I would you like to, to 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 also say that all my clients and everyone, every business, um, virtual reality or immersive technologies are not a replacement of what we have got. Okay, so let's be honest here. But the key answer here it's a blended approach. There are occasions where the face-to-face -face is important, as well as the e-learning, as well as the immersive. And most important thing is that, as uh, uh, Jan just uh, uh, claimed before on, on his experience, it's a blended approach. So you needed to have a multiple um, technologies implemented within your program. So in this blended approach, it's key, it's a fundamental, because every technology bring uh, benefits that no other technology can provide provide you with. So it's the sum of those uh, technologies, which then will uh, allow you to build a really strong L and D program for your organization. Yeah, this is yeah. fundamental. Excellent, excellent uh, point there and perspective. Thanks, Frank. Uh, and Jan, Frank, yep. I was just going to say, and, and Frank, just to stress that I think you know, learning from each other is such a huge piece. Um, mm -hmm. I, per I personally am a hands-on learner myself, so I understand that, but I think what's underestimated sometimes is how much we can learn from each other. And yeah. I think, you know, that's, that's the big piece of it too. I think that's, that's, that's a great Please. point, Terry. Yesterday I was having a conversation with the CEO of our parent company, Glenn Sanford, uh, and he made a comment that, uh, I haven't heard him say before, but that was really resonated with me is that 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 he has a certain sort of exhaustion of reading these days there's so much messaging across the organization when it comes to like reading whether it's workplace chats or emails or consuming content and I, it just sort of struck a chord because uh, i think it's particularly because also because of the pandemic the amount of kind of content we're consuming as a result of being more remote and more sort of isolated, it's really increased, increased significantly. And it's sort of uh, to the point you were making earlier, Frank, like how much of that content is being remembered, uh, I think is less and less because we're sort of in, in data overload. And so the way that we learn and the way that we engage socially, I think my from my um, layman's perspective is really a, a difference of, you know, changes the way that we kind of can learn better by having these conversations or having interactive uh, kind of workshops versus just trying to consume so much content. Micro learning also another sort of uh, uh, reason for, for being more effective. Um, Jan, what, 
when you see I'm still here. Yeah. yeah, you're still here. <laughs> still little sides. We were we sent you to the other side of the stage. Exactly. Um, yeah. uh, almost forgot about you over there. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> uh, when, when, you, when you think about um, the same sort of question in terms of return on investment from your perspective, being yeah. at, at, at such a, uh, a mm -hmm. not only a, a large organization, but an innovative organization like SAP, uh, what what are you thinking about today when it comes to like the success of these sorts of programs, and how does it change the way you think about 2022? Yeah, well, I think first of all, I think um, if you take a look at um, um, ROI or the business case, obviously uh, a program set up in a virtual way uh, with a micro learning with with a virtual um, presence like Fabela. Uh, is after all much cheaper than you fly everybody in across Northern Europe, et cetera. So, th so that's, that's an easy, easy calculation to make. Um, I think um, the return that you get on a program like this, it's um, um, uh, again, it's like Frank mentioned uh, from a qualitative and a quantitative uh, perspective. Uh, the, the best thing that you can get is the feedback, the feedback from, from customers that they were surprised, that they were overwhelmed with what uh, what what has been presented uh, to them, the, the experience that they experienced, uh, the accounting. Yeah? Uh, so let's say the internal feedback that you get from um, um, uh, from that individual who has gone through a training, but also the feedback that you get from the, the participants themselves. Uh, within that program, for example, we really encourage them to apply a growth mindset. That means to get out of your comfort zone, not too far, too too far out of your comfort zone, because then it's become dangerous. But that where that's but outside your comfort zone is where the learning really happens. So we really encourage them to try out new things, to apply principles that we taught them um, um, in this in this program. And um, if at the end of the program you get feedback and and imagine there are like like young people. Uh, straight from the university participating in this program, but also some veterans with 30 year plus uh, experience within SAP. And if you get the feedback from those people and say, well, I've been 25 years at SAP, I thought I knew it all, but after this program, I learned so much and there's still so much to learn. And, and even if you just talk about a growth mindset, thinking that you know everything already uh, um, states that you have a fixed mindset. Yeah, and that's what you want to overcome with a program like this. So it's it's the the feedback, the feedback from all different angles that justifies the investment. So the positive feedback from customers, the positive feedback from from the account teams where the participants um, uh, work in, uh, but also the the, the feedback from uh, from the participants them uh, themselves. I think that's the most valuable. Uh, those three pieces of feedback are the most valuable things to consider. Thanks for that. I think that's a really clear, clear way of looking at it. What what we've noticed, having run literally hundreds of of events ourselves in in our campuses, that there's this mixture of feedback between, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of of on Amazon reviews, where there are people are reviewing the product, and then some people reviewing the shipping, and some people reviewing the store. Is that you mm -hmm. have these different frameworks, right? The content, of course is key to see if, if it's being, if it's the right content, if it's being shared in the right way, then there's this other concept of the experience and, and whether the experience was seamless and was it more social and engaging. Yeah. Uh, and then there's other uh, components uh, to the event itself. So what we find is this is kind of a learning process for immersive engagement where it's so new it's like ordering your first thing on Amazon 15 years ago and realizing, uh, oh, I'm not reviewing the product. I'm actually reviewing the shipping experience or the checkout experience, yeah. right? And so it, we kind of have to create our own, I guess, guardrails or framework for that sort of experience because there's such a broad-based set of, a, uh, of different types of experiences that are, or feedback, I should say, that we're getting from these, yeah. these brand new immersive yeah. experiences. Um, yeah. Yeah, and what you mentioned there, Kirk, it's um, so you can take a look at it from very different perspectives. So, what did you really like about this uh, about this program? 
and um, if, is it um, is the piece of technology is it the content is it the structure is it the moments that we build in where they can connect etc and what we actually uh, as, as we were teaching them actually or uh, developing them on how to deliver an experience we also took uh, uh, we researched the content that's already out there and um, there was uh, there is this book from uh, Chip and Dan Heath it's called The Power of Moments, with the subtitle Why Certain Experiences Have Extraordinary Impact. And um, we got some inspiration out of that book. And, um, and actually, when we are teaching about how to deliver an experience to your customer, we got to make sure that the learning experience itself should be an awesome experience as well. You know, <laughs> all of which you don't make, uh, you don't make yourself credible. And and um, so what we got out of that book is that um, uh, so that every experience is built up out of so-called epic moments. And epic is an acronym. It stands for elevation, elevation. So do something that people don't expect. You elevate. P from pride. Make sure that there are moments of pride in that whole program. So people feel pride to what they've achieved, that they have stepped out of the comfort zone, that they learned something, that they applied something. So the P from pride. Inside, of course, people want to learn. That's, I think, the, the main body of, of any training uh, or learning and development program is that you have to provide them insights so that they learn, they actually get new knowledge. And the C of connection, and that's that connection which they have with their peers. So make sure that everything uh, what you do, uh, that's, that is a sequence of epic moments. So elevations, moments of elevation, moments of pride, moments of insight and moments of connection. And that's what we also did within the, um, uh, this learning and development program, that it was a lot of epic moments. And I if love this, that. That's, and if and if there's not a moment of elevation, it's not a moment of pride, insight or connection, then you really should ask, should it be in the program then? I love that. Uh, I haven't seen that book before, but I, I'm going to pick that one up. That's that's a new one to me. That yeah. that acronym is, is really powerful. Very much a simple way of of looking at uh, kind of what is important from an experience yeah. perspective versus you know uh, just a you know a, yeah. a content experience. But um, maybe small maybe small anecdote, uh, uh, Greg, is that um, in the book they don't talk about epic moments. They use the e, e uh, p i c, but they put it in a different order. And we thought, well, if you just turn it around, you can make the word epic, and that makes much more sense, and people will uh, will remember it. Remember it, yeah. Like, like Frank moment. said, like Frank said, after a month they know it's epic. Yeah. If they say p e i c whatever, they will forget right. about it. it. Doesn't make any sense. So. It doesn't. Yeah, it's Make hard it to remember, right? Yeah. I, I love that. That's that's really great. I've I've written that down on a post-it note here in my yeah, in my real like desk. In my real desk, yeah. I'll put it on a post-it note in my my virtual office when I get up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let, let's. Uh, I mean, this has been an incredible discussion on stories already. Uh, as we look to 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 close out the discussion, really want to get everybody's perspective of a couple minutes on on really how. Um, as you look ahead to L and D programs for next year, what's the one, if you can distill it into one piece of advice for next year for L and D leaders around the world, what would you be that, that one piece of advice to remember from this conversation? And I'll throw it back to Terry to be the first one on the hot seat for that one. Um, I, I think one of the things that we're really taking a hard look at for 2022 is more of that performance support tool and to be sure that the learning is not just one and done. You know, it's, it's great to have this learning experience, but in many cases, they need to make sure that they're taking what they've learned and are they applying it? Has it been effective as well as are they using it back? Um, on the job. And um, some of those innovations, you know, would be more of like an interactive um, web based, you know, participant guide or something where they could actually utilize that in a virtual setting as well as use afterwards, or whether it's an interactive infographic of some sort that if they're in the process of 
utilizing um, a tool or a process or a standard or what have you that they can actually go through and um, click on that and follow through the process um, in that case as well. So, um, you know, obviously we're always looking to expand not only our training itself and, and the courses that we're doing and so forth, but also on how we're delivering those in, in, in a different format. Um, another big piece for 2022 is that hybrid offer of suddenly now, instead of everyone in person or everyone virtually, we're going to have a mix just due to where we are um, now. And how do we accommodate that to be sure that everyone's getting the same level of learning, getting the same level of knowledge that they need, and it's an effective way to do that. Great. Uh, two great tips there, Terry. Thank you very much. Uh, Frank, other than implementing Virtuoso, what what is your tip for uh, 2022? Uh, um, more than uh, a tip, uh, I, I, I would you like to share with you potentially the three kind of uh, trends that we are we are seeing into the B2B market uh, uh, for the next uh, few months and the next year. Um, there are three key uh, trends that are happening. Um, inside LND. Uh, the first one is that they want to uh, deliver, I think, uh, you know, also Terry mentioned this, it's uh, to deliver immersive technologies across multiple channels. So not only uh, VR handsets, but also PCs, browsers, smartphones, tablets. So that is a key trend that we are, we are seeing right now. So it's almost becoming um, immersive technology, which comes uh, from one specific channel, like VR handsets, like Oculus 2, now they want to implement using multiple channels as well. The second trend that we are seeing is that now CIO inside a, a, a IT generally, it's getting into uh, into these technologies as well. So basically, uh, another trend that we are seeing is that now emerging technologies are becoming part of the IT uh, systems or integration with the current systems inside an organization. Think about integrating your L&D immersive experience with your LMS, for example, right? So creating SCORM compliant virtual reality training, not just you know e-learning. So that is another trend that we are seeing for the next uh, 12 months. And the last one is, at the beginning, we had more clients were relying on us to provide kind of uh, use cases for virtual reality training. But what we have seen now, because they now started using virtual reality, another trend that we are, we are, we are experiencing is that now L&D teams are actually coming with their own use cases. So basically, they are far more creative than one year before that they did have this kind of experience. So basically, more they're using this technology, more they more creative they are becoming to apply these technologies within within their organizations. So that is the three trends that we are we are experiencing, you know, today, and we're gonna experience more in the next twelve months. That's awesome. Thanks, thanks, Frank. Definitely some some insights from a huge number of uh, L and uh, uh, customers out there that are that are using your your technology. Jan, what is what are your uh, thoughts about this? Uh, what 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 is what is the way we should be thinking about? It? I mean, I think we already got some good tips from you on on, mm -hmm. on micro learning. Uh, I'm sure that's one of them. Is there others uh, things that we should be thinking about as L and D leaders in the space? Yeah, well, well, I have some some empathy with uh, with the uh, the participants, with the audience, actually the, the the people who needs to go through the through the training, through the learning and development, and realize that uh, if they are still working from home and uh, um, um, make sure that if you offer something that um, let's see if you can if they can do it based that they decide when they pick up the learning yeah, because p also people might have a different um, a different routine during the day normally when they would go to the office so consider that that it can be something like a self-paced uh, self-paced program and also to me keep it uh, and with that all that new technology uh, it will also become easier to make it much more uh, uh, personalized. 
Yeah, so it's more like this uh, use what you want to learn. Um, rather than you're sitting in a classroom, for example, and you just have to digest what the teacher is, is telling you. So make sure that it is, is personalized. And I think what, what um, 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 it has been mentioned before is um, when you share your learnings, it's where you learn a lot from, because it's also you learn what meant for the other person so during the coffee breaks you often have nice conversations oh that was interesting what we just learned etc and you talk about it but if people are in a remote uh, they're they're learning from home alone in their home office and they don't have the social actions um, how are you going to deal with that so make sure that you build in those moments of uh, of connection where people can start sharing with uh, with each other um, and uh, please go or stay away from just sending uh, a video they have to watch or just a zoom session where you have to talk where you have to listen to a person who's trying to teach you something so yeah keep it make sure that they do it self-paced personalized that they can do the selection this is relevant for me this is what i want to make uh, what uh, what i want to learn and 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 cater for that yeah the, the participants are able to share and to socialize and to connect with their peers Love that. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, those uh, tidbits of advice. I think when you talk about social engagement piece, like that to me personally, that's that's been the biggest mind shift from the last year and a half because we're all more we're easily connected in terms of messaging systems and video conferencing, and those technologies have really stood up in in this uh in these challenging times to connect people but that one piece of of how does social engagement activity affect how we um you know learn together work together have fun together have that fun seems, together yeah. right that yeah. seems to be yeah. the one piece that was you know that that these other technologies can't really provide yeah. us and and being invited to countless uh, video conferencing happy hours didn't really solve that problem over the last yeah. Yeah. 18 months. Yeah. And and so what I've been seeing a lot of is even with our onboarding new customers to Verbella or to events, we've really had to help them um, program, you know, yeah. engagements differently. Uh, can, I, can I can I add something, Craig, about that fun element? Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, we also try to build in some fun elements when well, we're all together here in Fabela. And um, so we, w what we did, we, for example, we had a pop quiz. Just in the main, the main room, we had a pop quiz. A pop quiz about the content, you know, so people could score and uh, let's see who's the best. But we also organized like a treasure hunt. They had to run through the whole Fabela campus to the area where they had to collect letters. And they put it in the right order, and the first person who would come would win a prize. And you could do it in pairs. So you see, like colleagues running around together, you know, go to the room searching for letters in order to um, to come up with that 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 riddle they had to they had to solve. Or we we had this where is Wally? So we hit somewhere on the screen a picture of Wally, and they had to search for him and create a, a selfie with him. And the first one who uh, who, um, who um, posted that uh, that uh, that selfie with Wally uh, won a prize. You know, and that, that is those fun elements because you, then you see in this in this virtual environment that um, uh, the the yeah, the little kid in those participants they 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 it, it appears again and really having uh, having fun. Yeah. And, and and then they forget that they are behind the screen. They are yeah. really and that's yeah it's about it immersiveness eh, of an environment like this. Uh, I I love that that so much. It it really is about not structuring right the activity too much, you know? And so we're so used to structured engagement when it's structured scheduled video conferences, structured, uh, you know, learning modules, structure. Yep. Almost like we have to, we have to give people time to be able to be, to have fun and engage, uh, you know, serendipitously in unstructured yep. moments. And uh, I think that's a fantastic example well we're, we're right here at 59 minutes into this fantastic conversation i wanted to uh thank uh the, our guest today uh jan terry frank thanks for, for making the time to to come in and uh be here and share your stories with us it's been a fantastic conversation appreciate your uh 
your uh, engagement, appreciate your forward thinking innovation within uh, the space and within your organizations. Uh, really valuable insights uh, and a lot of learnings to take away from from this uh, this hour that went by so quickly. Thanks again for audience members and and Terry, Frank, Jan. If there's ways you want the audience to connect with you. Uh, you know, LinkedIn link or uh, yep. Twitter handle, feel free to pop it into the public chat so folks can connect with you uh, after the session here. Uh, our tradition for any of these conversations and roundtables is to do a selfie up on the stage. We get uh, a, a photo of ending the event. So if uh, E. Katarina or Blair, let us know if we can, we can go ahead and do that or someone taking a photo would be fantastic. So with that, feel free to mingle after the event and connect if our uh, our uh, our team up here is, is available to spend a few more minutes to connect, great. If not, obviously we have busy busy days. And, and for Frank, I know it's it's late in Milan, so we understand, Frank, if you have to go to go to bed. <laughs> so, but thanks again, everybody. <laughs> Come on and join us on stage for a photo as, as we wrap things up. Thanks, Greg. Greg, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Jan. Yeah. Appreciate Thank you, the.